on financial institutions and markets. One thing to be aware of in terms of sort of the history of financial institutions is sort of prior to the 1930s, if you wanted to have checking and savings accounts, if you wanted to issue shares of stock, if you wanted to sell insurance, you could do all of those things as one single institution. Um, one of the things that resulted from the Great Depression was a lot of regulation and separation. So if you wanted to be a commercial bank, you could not also be an investment bank and you could not also be a life insurance company. So a lot of these different types of institutions were sort of had their genesis in terms of being distinguishable from one another uh, back in the 1930s. As time passed around the 1980s, there was a sort of period of deregulation where it was thought, well, Maybe it isn't so bad if a commercial bank also serves as an investment bank and maybe they also sell insurance. So there's more of a blurring of the distinctions today, um, but there are still distinctions. For example, like the People's Bank is a South Carolina, Anderson, South Carolina, local example of a commercial bank, basically where you'd have a checking account or a small loan, maybe a car loan. Um, a credit union is similar to a commercial bank. However, there's sort of a common bond of membership. Um, for example, here in Anderson, South Carolina, there's the Anderson Federal Credit Union. When I lived in Indiana, there was an Indiana University Credit Union. So if you worked for the university or if you were a student at the university, you could be a member of the Indiana University Credit Union. Um, typically, deposit rates are higher and loan rates are lower in credit unions because sort of you're sort of a member of the organization, whereas a commercial bank is trying to earn a profit. And so they pay out less on deposits and charge more on loans. But in, in any case, those are two types of sort of checking and savings account type of institutions. Um, an investment bank has the word bank in it, but it sort of specializes in something completely different. When a corporation wants to issue or raise money, they issue bonds as a form of borrowing or they issue shares of stock, a form of ownership. We'll talk more about stocks and bonds throughout the course, um, but an investment bank is sort of the specialty institution that helps a company issue stock or issue bonds. Goldman Sachs is our example. Um, the examples listed here will be sort of the ones you're going to need to be, be held responsible for in terms of knowing that Goldman Sachs is our example of an invest, investment bank. You don't necessarily need to know every possible investment bank or every possible credit union, but know the ones that are listed in the notes. A pension fund is a retirement plan. For example, in California, if you work for the state of California, you get money deposited into your retirement plan, and that's managed by the California Public Employee Retirement System, CalPERS. And there are links here to sort of find out more about these different institutions. But basically, that is the organization that's in charge of managing people's funds so that when they do retire, they get paid a certain amount upon retirement. Um, a mutual fund is an investment vehicle. It's where money is pooled together with a specific investment objective. Um, it would be hard for me to buy every company in the S&P 500. That would be almost impossible. I might have to buy five. That would involve 500 different transactions. Um, whereas if I buy a mutual fund that buys those shares, um, they can pool together everyone's money and basically get better prices. It's more efficient. And so it's more efficient for a mutual fund to buy all the different shares and sort of give me a prorated portion based on my contribution. Um, the example we're going to be responsible for is the Invesco small cap value fund. So that's a fund that specializes in buying small cap stocks that have low price earnings ratios. Value is basically low price earnings. Growth is a high price earnings type of stock. But in any case, that's our example of a mutual fund, which is similar to an exchange traded fund. The biggest difference is an exchange traded fund trades on an exchange like a share of stock. That's it's more liquid. For mutual funds to get in and out takes a bit of time. Uh, usually the wait to close out of your mutual fund uh, you have to wait till the end of the day and then they figure out what the fund's worth and give you your prorated share and then either transfer it to your bank or send you a check. An exchange traded fund, you can buy and sell shares um, with any brokerage account. Uh, the example I want to look at here is this Inspire International ESG, sort of Environmental Social Governance Fund. Um, WWJD is the ticker. So if we were to look at this link, it'll this is sort of their specialty. They are low-cost, biblically responsible investing ETFs. There's all kinds of different ETFs. There's all kinds of different ESG ETFs, but this one's specifically designed to 
invest in companies that sort of correspond with what they define as biblically responsible investing. Now that term's somewhat nebulous. I don't necessarily agree with every single uh, screening criteria they use, but in any case, I think it's a good idea. Um, it allows you to invest in a comp in companies that sort of serve the greater good. Um, some of their funds are listed here. WWJD buys international companies. Uh, Bless buys global companies. Uh, Inspire buys or Bible buys the biggest ETFs that are, I believe, in the United States. But they have five different funds. Uh, these three obviously have sort of biblical ticker symbols, uh, the ISMD, the Inspire Small Mid-Cap Funds, and then IB, the B being for a bond fund. So there's different types of ETFs even within a given company. Um, but I just wanted to point out to you this one because it, it's relatively new. This is new in the fall of 2019, but they have some other that have been around for a little bit longer. But this whole idea of biblically responsible investing is a relatively new concept. ESG investing is a relatively new concept. But in any case, I wanted to point that that's going to be our example for an ETF that we need to be familiar with. WWJD, not a mutual fund, it's an ETF. It's not a commercial bank, it's an ETF. All right. And then our example of a life insurance company, here's Mutual of Omaha. So that's somewhat tricky. Um, it's not a mutual fund, it's a mutual of Omaha, but it's a life insurance company. And you can read about what they do at that link there. In terms of identifying, well, how would we know? What is BAC or SYF or GS or PRU or RMAX? If those were the ticker symbols of different companies, how would we know even what their name is, what their standard industrial classification code is, what their NAICS code is, and what do they do? So here's our exercise. We're going to take a quick look at this link here. I'm going to try anyway. And that should take you you log it, it's a library. If you're on campus, logged into a university account, you wouldn't have to do this step. But if you're off campus, we need to log in to our university account. And that should access the library databases. And let's see what we have here. Okay, this is Mergent Online. That's what we want. And I believe the first company was BAC. I'm just going to type in the ticker BAC and see what shows up. All right, here's what I'm looking for BAC is Bank of America. That trades on New York Stock Exchange. That's the one we want. So Bank of America. And when I click that, my internet connection is slow. I'm sorry for that. And when we click that, it should take us to an overall summary of what's going on. What is the description of Bank of America? We're going to use Mergent throughout the semester. And we'll look at all these different, well, not sure, all of them. We'll look at a lot of these different tabs throughout the semester. But a couple of things we can notice is it says they're in the banking sector. It says their industry is national commercial banks. So apparently Bank of America is a commercial bank. So in addition to knowing the People's Bank, we also want to know that Bank of America is a commercial bank. Their SIC code is 6021. Their NASCS code is 522110. So in any case, there's a quick description that would fill in these blanks. We can know the Bank of America, their SIC code, their NASC code. We said they're commercial banking. So we'd fill in that first row there. I do want to point out to you, to get a little bit more detail, uh, we could look at this. Let me just show you where this is. It says, go to company details and select business. So if we're at this site, we get basically what we need for this exercise. But if we go under company details, business, we can get additional information. It says here's their primary NIC code, but they also have secondary codes. They also do brokerage, they also do trusts. Um, in terms of SIC classifications, they also do security brokers and so forth. These are just, this is more of a historical classification system. This is a slightly more detailed, slightly more up-to-date classification system. And this also allows you, well, how do I know who, the, who to compete them? You can search for, well, what are companies that have a primary SIC of 6021? And then I can know who their competitors are and so forth. We'll do that type of thing later on in the course. But in any case, there's our first glance at using Mergent. So we should be able to fill in the rest of this blank. We'll do one more. Well, we'll do two more just to point out a couple things. Let's try GS. What is GS? The quickest way to do that is just to change the company up here. I'm just going to put in GS. And it says GS, New York Stock Exchange, Goldman Sachs. That's what I'm looking for. All right. And we see Goldman Sachs primary SIC is 6211 security brokers. Um, all right, NAICS 523110, investment banking. Goldman Sachs, that was our example of an investment bank. So in any case, 
we would say in terms of our, we got a commercial bank, we got an investment bank, we got consumer lending, we got insurance, we got real estate. So those are the punchlines. You're going to want to use the Merchant Online to fill in this table and be familiar with those companies, what they do. One of the key, one thing you'll notice though, is all of these companies are financial institutions. All of their SIC codes start with a six. All of their NAICS codes start with a five, two. Now you might say, well, do all companies start with a six? Do all companies start with a five, two? I just want to point out one other company that's not a financial institution just to show you. Like if we were to look up the ticker symbol F, you see that's Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company is not a financial institution. Ford Motor Company is in auto manufacturing. Their SIC code's 3711. Their NAIC code's 336111. So generally speaking, these numbers sort of distinguish one industry from another, one sector within an industry from another. So in any case, you don't necessarily have to only focus on financial institutions, but for the purpose of our discussion today, that's why we're focusing on those. But you could study any industry. But one of the first things I would do in studying an industry or a company and its competitors is identifying, well, what are their SIC codes? What is their NIC codes in terms of finding comparable companies? Okay, turning to page two, we see we're shifting to markets. There's different types of financial markets. You could be trading physical assets like wheat, corn, or oil, or you could be trading financial assets like stocks and bonds. So that's one way of distinguishing financial markets. Is it a physical asset? Is it a financial asset? Similar, well, somewhat differently is, are you trading today or for a transaction in the future? You can buy wheat today, or you can make a contract to buy wheat three months from now or six months from now, a future contract. So that's the primary distinction between spots and futures, today or in the future. You could also distinguish between money market, capital market. Are you tra trading treasury bills? Are you trading treasury bonds? Treasury bonds are long-term, two to 30 years. Treasury bills are less than a year. Money market instruments are short-term. Capital market instruments are long-term. So are you in the short-term market, the long-term market? Are you in the money market, the capital market? And then our final distinction will be clarifies this. Are you in the primary market or the secondary market? If you were to log on to TD Ameritrade and buy shares of Ford today, you would be trading in the secondary market. Um, you would be buying shares from another shareholder, just exchanging existing shares. However, where did those shares come from? They came from the primary market. At some point in time, Ford issues those shares for the first time. When they're issued for the first time, that's a primary market transaction. Sometimes that's an initial public offering or anytime you issue additional shares, a seasoned offering, that's a primary market transaction. And that's the primary focus of investment banks is issuing shares or bonds for the first time. Um, brokerages tend to trade shares on existing markets, whether they be the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ stock market or whatever. But in any case, it turns out there's lots of markets. I mentioned two, New York Stock Exchange, um, NASDAQ, if we were to click this link here, it should take us to some global stock markets. And we can see that there's a lot of them. There's a market in Argentina, margin in Australia, margin in Austria. It's in alphabetical order. If we scroll down here in the United States, there's the NASDAQ stock market. There's the New York Stock Exchange. Those are the two biggest in the United States. The United States is pretty, there's multiple stock markets in the United States. It's one of the the financial cap, it's pretty much the financial capital of the world, although you could say some of the Asian areas like Hong Kong, let's try that, Hong Kong, they've got an exchange as well. Um, that general area, the Asian markets, there's different markets throughout the world, obviously. Some, most countries have a stock market. I'm not sure. I'd say that looks to be about more than half the countries have a stock market. Some don't. Um, Belarus doesn't have a listed stock market here although they have something called a stock market, it just doesn't really trade a whole lot of shares and some of those sort of command and control economies. Um, although you do see, we could see Russia has got a stock market. Um, in any case, that's just to give you an idea of different countries and their existence of stock markets. Those would be secondary markets for the most part. All right, in terms of instruments, the ones we're gonna focus on are common stock issued by corporations, and that could theoretically last forever. So that's a capital market instrument. Preferred stock is kind of a hybrid. We'll talk more about this in the future between stock and bond. 
Um, that's issued by corporations and could last forever. Bonds are issued by corporations. When we talk about bonds, we need to be careful. We talk about corporate bonds, municipal bonds, treasury bonds. Basically, it depends who's the issuer is. If we're talking about Ford Motor Company, that's a corporate bond. If we're talking about the state of South Carolina, that's a municipal bond. If we're talking about the United States government, that's a treasury bond. So bonds have long maturities. They're capital market instruments. The federal government also borrows short term through treasury bills. And I should say that corporations also borrow short term through different instruments, but we're not going to focus on those instruments. We do want to be familiar with um, treasury bills, treasury bonds, treasury notes, short term, long term treasuries. They're going to serve as our proxy for risk free returns. Municipal bonds have tax advantages and then corporations are going to be our primary focus. We're going to talk about how they raise money more on a long term basis. Um, it turns out there are some passages in the Bible that relate to the topic at hand, sort of prices. What are the prices of these financial instruments? Um, there's a lot of discussion, or at least a lot of passage related to weights and measures and moving landmarks. And I would say if we read through them all, let's just take a look at, let's say, Ezekiel 45.10. So if we were to look at Ezekiel 45.10, this is the message translation. Um, I've put up with you long enough princes of Israel, quit bullying and take advantage of my people. Do what's just and right for a change. Use honest scales, honest weights, honest measures. Every pound should have 16 ounces. Every gallon should have four quarts. The ounce is the basic unit of measure for both. And your coins must be honest. No wooden nickels. The general point of this particular passage is that be honest. The price should reflect the true value. And that's going to be important. It's kind of related to efficient markets. If prices reflect their true value, the markets are more efficient. When that's not the case, it's hard for markets to work effectively. Now, I did use the message translation on purpose. I just want to point out to you, if we change the translation to, say, the NIV, we use the NIV translation, and we look at the same passage, is equal 45, 10 through 12. It starts talking about epas, bass, shekels, minas. Those are different denominations that were applicable at the time of the writing of Ezekiel. And we don't want to get lost in the translation there is, what are they talking about? They're basically talking about prices. And that's true of all of these different passages. Sometimes they're talking that you, they're basically advocating you should use honest prices. Sometimes they're saying we should punish people who don't use honest prices. But in any case, I think these are related to, they're obviously not written specifically for, stock prices that should be efficient, but they're related to. And I'd say if we used honest prices, markets would be more efficient. And that's a good thing. It allows companies to raise capital. It allows companies and businesses to grow. So we want honest prices. All right, here are some historical returns in the United States. There's three here. The blue dots are stock returns from, looks like 1928 through 2018. Uh, the red is treasury bill returns. And the green are treasury bond returns, 10-year treasury bond returns. One thing to note is these blue dots are way all over the place. Some years there are 40% return, some years they're negative 40% return. Um, stock prices are very volatile. And this isn't just one single stock, this is the S&P 500. So that's like a portfolio of 500, this is basically the market. This is a proxy that we'll typically use for the stock market and the stock market's very volatile. Um, bonds, are volatile, they're moving around, but it's not quite as much. You never really lose 20% in any one year, but you never really, you know, from time to time you gain 20%, but you never really lose 20%. Um, for these short-term instruments, these treasury bills, you you never really gain 10, you never really lose 10. They're much less volatile. So they're related to risk. The volatility is sort of a risk measure. We're gonna use standard deviation as a risk measure. We'll use average return as sort of a proxy for the average. We'll talk more about both of those in the future, but here's one thing I wanted you to be aware of. I was born in 1969, so I picked that as a point of reference. What if we invested a dollar in 1969? Well, and all we did is each year we invested in treasury bills. So four times a year I invest in treasury bills and I get a yearly return. That one dollar would turn into 10. That's good. That's a 10 time return over the course of my life. In 50 years, one dollar turns into 10. The problem with that return is that, well, what was inflation? Well, it's probably about 10. I mean, if we, the consumer price index or inflation index is not listed here, but for the most part, we would not get any real increase in purchasing power investing in treasury bills over a long period of time. What about bonds? Ah, bonds. Yeah, that $1 in 1969, that turns into about 
What is that exactly? It turns out that's 2546. Can't see that exactly, but that's what it is. 2546 at the end of 2018. That's a pretty good return. Yeah, $1 to 25. What, what else? But what are some other long-term investing options I had? Well, what about the stock market? What if I invested $1 in the S&P 500 at my birth? What would I have now? That's $103. Oh my goodness, that's quite a bit more than 10, quite a bit more than 25. And that's true in general. The stock market over long periods of time tend to dwarf returns in other markets. Less risky, these are less, these, this is more volatile, some big drops, some big gains. Um, but this was, over a long period of time, the big gains overwhelmed the big drops, at least in the United States. Here are some sort of summary statistics um, for 90 years, 50 years, 10 years, stock returns are bigger than treasury bill returns, bigger than treasury bond returns. However, so those are average returns over those periods of time. Double digits for stocks, single digits for bonds, basically the inflation rate for bills. Um, however, we also see this measure, we'll talk more about this measure in the future, but a lot more volatility. The standard deviation is double digits for stocks, single digits for bonds, and less than 5% for treasury bills. Those aren't bouncing around. Them. That's related to this bouncing around business. You have a much higher standard deviation when you're bouncing around or around the average. 40 plus 40 minus 40 plus 20 minus 10. On average, that's positive, but there's a lot of volatility. Or there's not much volatility in this red line, but there's not a whole lot of appreciation over time. So these are summary statistics. So in any case, there's some stock market returns over the course of my life. Here are some questions we want to be familiar with with respect to financial institutions and markets. I'm just going to tell you the answers. Um, you'll want to think about, about them. And uh, if you have trouble with understanding the answer, uh, send that email to your instructor. But for the most part, one is false, two is false, three is true, four is true, five is false, six is true, seven is false, eight is true, nine is true, 10 is true, 11 is false, 12 is true. So those are the types of questions that are relevant to financial institutions and markets. Um, again, if you have any questions related to the material, make sure you send an email to your instructor. Otherwise, also, do read through the notes in more detail um, and also check out the links just to see what the company itself says about what they do. But that's going to be our characterization of institutions and markets. Good luck.